The benefits of exercise. Experts tell us that exercising on a regular basis uh, every day as much as possible is the single most important thing you can do for your health. In the short term, exercise helps to control appetite, boost mood, and improve sleep. In the long term, it reduces the risk of heart disease, stroke, diabetes, depression, dementia, and many cancers. But with all the benefits, isn't it strange that most often we have to be intentional about getting exercise? When we don't make a commitment, when we don't make it a habit, when we don't have at least somewhat of a plan, we tend to not be as physically active. We choose other ways to fill our time. Discover the words, Daniel Ryan Day. So for the next two weeks, that's what we're going to talk about. It's training and working out, and by the end, we'll all have a different training Yay. regimen. <laughs> <laughs> but we're not going to talk about training physical muscles oh, as okay. much, although maybe there'll be some overlap. But we're going to talk about training some spiritual muscles in our spiritual lives. Yeah, because if regular physical exercise is the best thing you can do for your health, could it also be true that there are some regular spiritual exercises that could be of benefit to your spiritual life and your relationship with God and with others? Well, let's explore that on this episode of the Discover the Word podcast. Yeah, hi, and welcome to Discover the Word, Bible engagement from Our Daily Bread Ministries in which we invite you to be part of the group of friends who explore together topics and passages that inform the way we read the Bible and challenge us as we live our lives as followers of Christ. Regular group members, Daniel Ryan Day, Elisa Morgan, Bill Crowder, and Rasul Berry are part of this study. Mark Dehan and Vivian Mabuni are sitting this one out, but they'll be back at the table again soon. And we're calling this two-part series of conversations, Spiritual Habits and Training. And we're leveraging the fact that intentionally making it a habit to do push-ups or stretching or walking or other physical activities has physical benefit. And so are there also activities that have spiritual benefits and promote spiritual health? And there are some passages of scripture that actually do inform us on this. So let's pull our chairs up to the table with the group and let's listen as Daniel gets things started. Does anyone like to exercise or maybe you have a regular exercise routine that you enjoy doing? You know, it's funny because like to exercise, it depends on the exercise. (laughs) Some (laughs) things I like more than others. But the routine, the biggest thing that I've started doing is I actually got a personal trainer in the gym. Serious. And that was because I would go to the gym and kind of just be a little like confused about what I Mm -hmm. should do. But now... I have this person who I think sometimes I call him an uh, advanced torture expert um, <laughs> who uh, gives me direction. And it's really helpful because it helps with form. And I just actually know what to do now. Mm-hmm. You know, actually, I get intimidated in the gym. I don't know what to do with all those equipment things. And so I just go out my front door and start walking. Mm. Yeah, that's, that's, that's my what routine. I, do. I walk in the mornings and then again, I walk in the evenings. And in my younger years, when I was in sports, Uh, There was one season in which I was running cross country and I would run miles and miles a day. And then when I got into playing soccer, obviously there was a training regimen that went Mm -hmm. along specifically for my position, which was goalkeeper. Yeah. And what is kind of the difference between just working out generally and working out toward a goal like Well, because you have a goal, there's a target you're aiming at and it's not an end unto itself. It's a means to an end. Mm -hmm. So when I was training for playing goalie in soccer... There were specific drills that I had to do that nobody else on the team had to do Mm. because you use a different set of muscles. You have a different set of, quote, athletic responses, unquote, to situations. Yeah. And when do you know if the training's working or not? In my case, it's been cool to see the personal trainer actually be really encouraged Mm. by Mm. feeling like, Mm -hmm. hey, man, like you're able to do things that you weren't able to do before. And then, of course, I feel better. Yeah. And I think about athletes that play professionally or something like that in particular when I think about training toward a goal because, Bill, kind of in your example of training as a goalie, you know it works when you're in the goal and someone takes a shot that maybe you wouldn't have blocked normally and then all of a sudden you block that shot, right? And so it's in the moment of pressure in the game. That's what you've been working Mm -hmm. so hard toward. 
So for the next two weeks, that's what we're going to talk about. It's training and working out. And by the end, we'll all have a different training Yay. regimen. <laughs> <laughs> but we're not going to talk about training physical muscles oh, as okay. much, although maybe there'll be some overlap. But we're going to talk about training some spiritual muscles in our spiritual lives. And so I want to start with a passage that I think will help us kind of get our minds around this idea. It's in the letter that we call First Timothy. And if we could, let's read chapter 4, verses 7 through 10, if somebody will get that for us. Have nothing to do with profane and foolish tales. Train yourself in godliness, for while physical training is of some value, godliness is valuable in every way, holding promise for both the present life and the life to come. The saying is sure and worthy of full acceptance. For to this end we toil and suffer reproach, because we have our hope set on the living God, who is the Savior of all people, especially those who believe. Do you see any nod to physical training in there? Yeah, he says it's of some value. I mean, you know, (laughs) I think he's not going to go crazy about physical training, but he, he does seem to prioritize the train yourself in godliness. Yeah, part. which is kind of a surprising phrase in some ways, I think. Train yeah. yourself in mm-hmm. godliness. Yeah, yeah, so what does he mean by godliness? Why don't you read verse 12 for us? Okay. And that might give us a, a good place to ask that question. Okay. First Timothy 4, verse 12. Let no one look down on your youthfulness, but rather in speech, conduct, love, faith, and purity, show yourself an example of those who believe. Yeah. So that could be a good starting spot to talk about godliness, right? So what's kind of the context for this letter? Timothy is Paul's guy. I mean, he mm-hmm. Paul mentored a bunch of people in the New Testament era, mm-hmm. but it seems like there was a special bond between Paul and Timothy so that he calls him my dear son in the faith. Yeah. Right? And he's writing to Timothy specifically. But it's not just for Timothy. So it's kind of a neat thing to think about the audience. I mean, it is for Timothy in his own discipleship, but it's also for this group of house churches that Timothy is also shepherding. Mm -hmm. Well, I think one of the things is that he, he tells them in the first chapter, as I urged you when I went into Macedonia, stay there in Ephesus so that you may command certain people not to teach false doctrines any Mm -hmm. longer or to devote themselves to myths and endless genealogies. So he sent him also on a mission Mm -hmm. to help folks get some things right. And sometimes we lose sight of the fact that Timothy is very active in leading in the early church. Mm -hmm. It's not just that he kind of tags along with Paul. Paul sends him. Yeah, we often. think of him kind of as a protege, you know, who's in the yep. wings, but yeah. he's actually in leadership. But think yeah. about the church at Ephesus. I mean, it was founded by Paul and his missionary team. And then Paul was there for a while as, quote unquote, the pastor. And then Timothy came as the pastor. And then <laughs> later, the apostle John was the pastor. So, mm-hmm. I mean, they had a pretty good run there. <laughs> <laughs> they had yeah. a good wow. bench strength, yeah. Yeah. And we have some kind of sense that Timothy's a little younger, maybe, mm-hmm. than some of the other leaders. So what might be helpful about having a letter like this from Paul as he's dealing with exactly, Rasul, what you were describing that he's supposed to be dealing with? Yeah, I think it almost seems like this letter was for Timothy, what your personal trainer, Rasul, mm-hmm. oh, that's is good. for you. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Somebody yeah. to kind of walk you through the process that's and good, help though. you figure out which step to take next, and yes. things like that. Yeah, and also training and trainers, they don't just give you steps, but they also give you encouragement. Yeah. Mm-hmm. They also push you. And I think I see Paul doing that as well. Don't let anyone look down on you because you are young. Yeah. But set an example in speech. You can do this. You know, God's spirit is on you. And so he's coaching him. Yeah. That encouragement you're talking about, Rasul, is really important because we find out in the second letter to Timothy that it's possible that Timothy had a little bit of a problem with fear yeah. and anxiety. Uh, Paul tells him, God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and love and a sound mind. And it seems he's combating something that Timothy's wrestling with. Mm. So encouragement always helps <laughs> when no you get that. Yeah. And let's say, Rasul, with your trainer, that the trainer that you ended up getting mm-hmm. was the same trainer that trains LeBron James. Right. 
What level of respect would that potentially give you in the gym? Oh, man. I mean, all the <laughs> respect in the world. It's like right. an ultimate <laughs> level recommendation to see this person yeah. who's defying age and is this mm -hmm. you know, physical specimen being like, hey, that's my guy. He, yeah. he coaches yep. him and he's coaching me too. <laughs> yep. And so I wonder if there's another layer here of authority as well yeah. that by Paul giving Timothy this letter, knowing the types of people that Timothy's going to be, debating and working with and those types of things. I wonder if it's it's like he's getting his certificate mm -hmm. from the big dog. Yeah. <laughs> right? yeah. Um, the word for train here is the word gymnazo. Hmm. Does that sound like any word sure that you does. would recognize? What would that Gymnasium. be? Gymnasium. Gymnasium. Uh -huh. Yeah. He's using a metaphor here, right? Of these exactly. other athletes that you see training for very specific purposes do that, but do it for what? Godliness. Godliness. Yeah. Mm. yeah. And so going back to the verse that Bill read, set an example in speech, conduct, love, faith, and purity. I think what Paul's really encouraging Timothy here is in the same way that I've been an example for you, part of your role as a leader of this church is to also be an example. Mm. Be an example of what? Godliness. Godliness. Mm -hmm. And what does that word start off with? God. Yeah. God, mm. right? So at its core, being an example, training yourself in godliness is leaning into what it looks like to be a Jesus follower and to reflect that into the world. Now, who ultimately helps us do that? The Holy Spirit. Right. <laughs> yeah. He's the, the power that we have within us. But it is really interesting to think about our process of becoming more like God Mm -hmm. like training because that speaks to intentionality yeah. it speaks to focus it's not just going to happen just because i happen to sit in a church on a sunday or because who i'm around it's something that i have to deliberately you know move into yeah. just it's, like it's, being in a gym doesn't mean i'm just going to get stronger just right I'm in the building. <laughs> yeah i agree it's intentionality and focus but i would also add participation mm -hmm. yep if anything good happens it's because the holy spirit's done it but we need to participate with the holy spirit in that process of training yeah yeah, yeah. and it's important to acknowledge what we're not saying which this isn't about becoming a Christian or, or salvation, right? Right. We're not earning our salvation by doing these things. It's as we lean into what it means to be a saved person, we train in godliness. We become an example in speech and conduct and love and faith and purity. And so we have some responsibility in our spiritual lives. There's work that we can do. We have to train. And that's what we're going to explore this week and next week. Being godly takes training, just like physically. Having an exercise routine helps us be healthier. There are exercises that can help us develop our spiritual muscles. And so the first spiritual habit that we'll look at is one that Daniel says is his favorite. But it may be a little surprising that we start the series about things we can do, exercises to help us get in better shape spiritually with this particular one. But they say that this is also an essential part of a physical exercise program. When you get serious about training, you don't want to leave this one out. So we're talking about spiritual practices or disciplines that have been passed down to us from the church that are found in the scriptures that help us train in godliness. And so the first spiritual practice is my favorite one that we're invited into in the scriptures because it's rest. <laughs> <laughs> and in fact, one of the things the church has passed down to us is something called a rule of life, which came from St. Benedict. And the idea is that you structure your life in such a way that you lean into these practices that empower and equip you to live out our faith, both in loving God and loving others. And so that's what all of these practices ultimately are about, is about leaning into our relationship with God in a way that helps us love God and love others. And it just so happens that one of those, and a really important one, and, your and favorite one that one. we <laughs> neglect a lot in our lives is rest. Mm 
So just saying rest in the Bible, what are some of the passages you would expect us to look at? I think of Exodus 20, you know, okay. about the Sabbath and the Ten Commandments. Yeah. Mm. I think about Jesus saying, come to me, all who are weary and burdened down, and I will give you rest. Mm. I like that one. Yeah. And Matthew I think 11. about yep. Genesis, how God rested on the seventh Let's day. Let's read that one. Okay. Uh, chapter 2 of Genesis, verses 1 through 3. Read that for yeah. us. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all their multitude. And on the seventh day, God finished the work that he had done. And he rested on the seventh day from all the work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and hallowed it because on it, God rested from all the work that he had done in creation. Yeah. So does God get tired? Isn't that interesting? I've always heard it explained that for God, it was not the rest of fatigue, but the rest of fulfillment. Mm -hmm. Mm. He was able to rest because the work was done much in the same way as it describes Jesus is now seated Mm. at the right hand of the Father in a position of rest because he's completed his work. That's yeah. nice. I like that. It, it is interesting that the work that he had done mm-hmm. is said three times in this short little section. Yep. And so there's that passage, which is probably one of the most famous passages on rest. Although, Bill, the one you mentioned is also pretty famous, mm-hmm. which is Matthew 11, where Jesus invites all who are weary and heavy laden to find rest in him. Um, there's also, we did a series on Psalm 127, Could someone read Psalm 127, verse 2? I got that. It is in vain that you rise up early and go late to rest, eating the bread of anxious toil, for he gives sleep to his beloved. Yeah, and we unpacked that in a lot more detail in that series. But the idea is that rest and sleep are gifts from God that he gives people. And in that, we talked about how that word for sleep in particular doesn't mean necessarily asleep, but that even in our lack of sleep, sometimes it's still a trusting in God, a resting in God as the one who's in control. And that's something hopeful when we can't sleep. It's an exercise. It's a training to trust every time we go to anxiety. I have a confession. What? I really struggle with this principle of rest Mm -hmm. um i live in new york city like the city Uh actually accelerates this inner drive that doesn't sleep yes i live in the city Mm -hmm. that never sleeps Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and i can't blame it on new york i was like this before i moved (laughs) right like i think it's weird but it's hard to actually shut it down and, and and actually trust god that with all the work that's undone at the end of a day all the work that's undone at the end of a week to just let it stay undone and rest. I I struggle with that. Help me. Yeah. Hey, this practice and this conversation is for you. (laughs) It's going to change your life. Um, (laughs) Let's go to a passage where it would have also been really difficult to rest and be at peace. Isaiah 30, Mm -hmm. and we're going to read verses 15 through 18. And this is a kind of hidden passage about rest, I think, because typically when people look at this passage, they kind of skip over that part of it and see the rest of what's going on for very good reason. There's a lot of tension in this passage. There's a lot of, well, we'll just read it and we'll, we'll go from there. So Isaiah chapter 30 verses 15 through 18, and maybe Rasul, you get us started since you already self-admitted this is a struggle. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) For thus said the Lord God, the Holy One of Israel, In returning and rest, you shall be saved. In quietness and in trust shall be your strength. But you refused and said, no, we will flee upon horses. Therefore, you shall flee and we will ride upon swift steeds. Therefore, your pursuers shall be swift. And it goes on in verse 17. A thousand shall flee at the threat of one. At the threat of five, you shall flee until you're left like a flagstaff on the top of a mountain, like a signal on a hill. Therefore, the Lord waits to be gracious to you. Therefore, he will rise up to show mercy to you. For the Lord is a God of justice. Blessed are all those who wait on him. Yeah. So it's kind of a surprising invitation there because Israel's in a tough spot. There's a lot of pressure specifically coming from the Assyrians at this point in the story. And as Assyria has become this huge, powerful nation for that time, 
they've started sucking up all these small countries into what we call vassal states, which basically acknowledges the king of Assyria is our king, we serve the Assyrians, and we send as a result money, soldiers, all those things to the bigger power. So that's kind of happening here. And some of those small countries are like, you know what, that sounds great. Don't wipe us out. We'll do what you have for us to do. And there's a lot of tension in Israel at this point because it's like, well, do we become a vassal state Mm -hmm. or do we go to Egypt and get them to come and help us fight Mm -hmm. against them? And God had specifically warned them against making future alliances with Egypt where they had been previously held as slaves. So, you know, like you said at the start, Daniel, they're in a really tough spot because on the one side you've got Assyria that wants to plow them out. (laughs) And on the other side, you've got Egypt that they're not supposed to use as a resource. Yep. And at the beginning of this chapter, chapter 30, could someone read verses one through two? Because that's going to be important for us as we think about what you just mentioned about don't go to Egypt. Verse one, woe to the rebellious children, declares the Lord, who execute a plan, but not mine and make an alliance, Mm. but not of my spirit, in order to add sin to sin, who proceed down to Egypt without consulting me, to take refuge in the safety of Pharaoh, and to seek shelter in the shadow of Egypt. Yeah, There you go. That's pretty direct. Yeah. Yeah, and what specifically about this does he say is rebellious? What are kind of the themes that show up? It's not just about going to Egypt. They're going there in a specific way. And well, what is that? Carrying out your own plan. Your you own know, plan. Not God's plan. Yeah. Against his will. I mean, it's pretty... Without asking for his counsel. Yeah. Well, They're... and also looking to something other than God mm-hmm. for their security and sure. strength. It just, I think about the contrast of like this activity versus the beginning of David's life where he was always seeking the Lord first before doing things Mm -hmm. and here there's a lot of activity happening outside of any kind of seeming Mm -hmm. consultation with god yeah and what are they looking for in pharaoh in egypt protection and Mm -hmm. shelter i mean salvation yeah yeah think about some of that language in there in the passage that we just read going down to take refuge to seek shelter in the shadow of egypt someone read psalm 91 verses 1 through 2 and listen for some of those same phrases Whoever dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Yeah, so it's all those same themes, resting in the shadow, finding Mm -hmm. refuge. Mm -hmm. And so instead of seeking that in God, they're seeking that in Pharaoh and in Egypt. Mm -hmm. And in the ancient world, it's really important to always remember as we're reading these old stories that you didn't just connect with a nation and they protected you and that was that going to another nation for protection was going to their gods for protection Mm -hmm. and so when you're seeking pharaoh when you're seeking egypt for protection you're seeking their gods for protection as well and that was what really got solomon in trouble because Mm -hmm. he entered into political alliance marriages. In fact, out of his thousand wives, 700 of them were princesses that were political alliance marriages with other countries. And his first one was with a daughter of Pharaoh Mm. in Egypt. Yeah. So what is the way that Isaiah is saying that God's inviting them to find protection? In rest. Yeah. And I'm already weaving this through Daniel thinking, how do I make alliances with other sources besides God to give me rest, you know, mm-hmm. Netflix, <laughs> you know, basically, you know, or a good book or, I mean, those things are fine. Those things are fine. But, you know, is my chief, is the chief place I go to God? Is it surprising that God's like, oh, if you really want to know how to fight this battle, here you go. In quietness and yeah. rest, you shall be saved. In quietness and trust mm-hmm. shall be your strength feels kind of like the opposite of what you actually need if there's another nation breathing down your neck, right? Mm -hmm. You know what you should do? Quietness and trust. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) And yet at the same time, like as someone who struggles with this rest, that bread of anxious toil Mm -hmm. realizes it never satisfies. That's right. You know, it just continues to weigh you down because there's always something else to do when you try to rely on your own strength. 
And so it is counterintuitive, but I also find it very inviting to be like, stand still, be still and know that I am God. Uh, that's good, Rasul. And for me, I don't necessarily have a problem with rest. I struggle with inactivity. Mm. And inactivity is not the same thing as rest. Mm. Mm. Doing nothing is not the same thing as resting necessarily because you can have all kinds of mental and emotional anxiety going on right. while you're sitting there being inactive. So for me, learning to find the balance to where inactivity fits into rest and the component that it is and can be for rest, to me, that's the needle that needs to be threaded. What Isaiah's, I think, trying to draw their attention to is... He's not saying just go to sleep and it'll all go away. Quietness, rest, trust, and maybe that's the key word when it comes to what's the difference between rest that's a spiritual practice and just going to sleep and wishing everything would go away. It kind of pivots on trust. And God's described in this passage as a God who waits to be gracious to you. This is verse 18. Who will rise up to show mercy to you. He's a God of justice. Blessed are all those who wait for him. And so the resting is tied to this waiting and trusting on this God. And his character. And Mm -hmm. on his character. And that really connects back to the first conversation where the training is absolutely dependent upon the Holy Spirit working in us and through us. This is the Old Testament people being called to rest in God the same way we're challenged to rest in the Spirit. And the truth is we live in the opposite of a restful world. So this actually is, it requires training and discipline for us to be intentional about rest. But this is the invitation that God has for us too. For thus says the Lord God, the Holy One of Israel, in returning and rest you shall be saved. In quietness and in trust shall be your strength. Yeah, we're talking about spiritual habits that can help us lean into our relationship with God. And that is a spiritual habit that can be easy to not see as important when actually it's essential. Rest is a key spiritual discipline or practice. It's more than just looking for an escape. It's really a way of deepening our trust in God and not placing our trust in things that ultimately will not satisfy. The first thing on our list of spiritual habits and training is a commitment to rest. Well, in our next segment, we're going to go from a spiritual discipline that's easy to forget to maybe one of the more obvious practices that promotes a healthy spiritual life and relationship with God. Uh, We're going to talk about prayer. But while it is maybe one of the more obvious, do you ever struggle with prayer? I think struggles are everyone's experience with prayer. Uh, Haddon Robinson, who led the conversations here on Discover the Word for over 20 years, I once put it this way. I admire men and women who give prayer a high priority in their lives. Frankly, prayer has proved to be the most difficult discipline in my life. At different times, I've found it strenuous or boring or frustrating, even confusing. Over the years, a solid prayer life has been more intermittent than persistent. Oh, occasionally I've grabbed hold of the hem of the garment only to discover I couldn't sustain the grass. Out of my experience, I've learned that you can't simply say your prayers. Prayer, real prayer, is tough, hard business. Yeah, and yet I do remember Haddon being a person who prayed. Because as difficult as he said he found it, uh, he also was convinced that prayer, communication with God, is as essential to our spiritual well-being as breathing is to our physical life. And so the group talks about prayer and how crucial it is to our spiritual well-being after we take a break to tell you about another aspect of our Daily Bread Ministries that we'd like you to be aware of. Now, in addition to being part of the group here on Discover the Word, Daniel also leads another aspect of our Daily Bread Ministries called Reclaim Today. Uh, Daniel, what is Reclaim Today? And how might it help us develop some of the spiritual habits, uh, spiritual disciplines that we'll be talking about in this series? Yeah, thanks so much for asking, Brian. Uh, So we focus specifically on those in their 20s and 30s or between the ages of 18 and 39. And we help them connect with God in the ordinary everyday moments of life. So if you're between those ages, this is for you. 
And if you're not in those ages, pass it on to someone else. And I'm going to guess you might find some stuff helpful too. Yeah. <laughs> and is the content developed mainly by people in that age group? It is. Yeah, it's all designed and written by people who are walking with Jesus, who love Jesus, and who are between the ages of 18 and 39 as well. And even the word reclaim uh, from reclaim today, if you think about it, it's the gospel in a word. We've been reclaimed from sin and death. We're invited into God's work of reclaiming the world. And the reason today is there is because one of the things that we saw in research for uh, younger generations, but really just about anybody, is that we feel a lot of regret and shame from the past. And so if we reclaim today, what we're saying is we're letting go of all of those things in the past, not forgetting them, but letting go of the shame and the fear because God's forgiven us for those things. And then there's a lot of worries about the future and if we just reclaim today, then we're leaning into what Jesus invited us to do, which is not to worry about tomorrow because today has enough concerns of its own. So let's reclaim today. Let's lean into God's work of reclaiming the world. That sounds like an awesome mission. It kind of tells me why you also have a real emphasis on spiritual disciplines and practices yeah. and things that can help us develop our relationship with God. Exactly, because if you think about it, all the things we do every day, those are the things that shape us into the type of people that we become. And so, sure, God is the first mover, the most important one that's at work in our lives to train us and develop us into who we become, but we also have a role to play in the ways that we live each day. And so the habits we form, the practices that we do, that shapes us into a certain kind of people. And so if you go to reclaimtoday.org slash habits, uh, we have these spiritual disciplines that have been passed down to us for generations in the church that invite us to live life with him and let that be the driving force in our lives that shapes us into who we become. Right. So I would highly recommend that Discover the Word group members go to reclaimtoday.org slash habits and explore that section of their site on spiritual disciplines that can really help grow our relationship with God. And I'd ask you to refer others there to reclaimtoday.org slash habits. And so do you find prayer difficult? Is prayer something that you struggle to consistently spend time doing? Well, our hope is that this uh, next part of the conversation will help you purpose to make it a spiritual habit that you see the need of developing further. So we're continuing to talk about spiritual and biblical disciplines and practices that have been passed down to us from the church. And so we're going to talk about one today that I think won't surprise us. We're going to talk about prayer as a practice. So when I say prayer, what comes to mind? Praying, <laughs> yeah. talking and listening to God. The Lord's Prayer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Communication. Mm. And if I'm honest, grace <laughs> for mm -hmm. a meal. Yeah. Oh, that's yeah. good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. And I think also how important prayer was to Jesus. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When do you most often pray? Need. Need. Yep. Yeah. A lot of times it is driven by need or by particular circumstance or by hearing something from a friend or family yeah. member who has a need. As far as, you know, a discipline, the closest I would have for that is I said in an earlier conversation that I walk in the mornings and in the evenings and in the mornings I pray as I walk. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great. Is there any circumstances or situations where it's easy for you to forget to pray or you realize you wished you had prayed about that thing? Oh, yeah. I was just thinking about that this morning frustration and especially with people <laughs> <laughs> will cause me to very easily do go horizontal mm -hmm. and and it's funny like if you think about prayers communication i end up more easily communicating with uh, someone else do you see what yep. they did can you believe this yep. and feeling the need to download and process that as much as i can and so this morning i remember feeling the sense of unsettledness and unalignment with God in that. And I'm like, I need to bring that rawness yeah. to mm -hmm. you. And when you do that, that deepens the intimacy and the connection. But it's so easy for me to just go to other, someone else. Yeah, that's honest. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for me too. And so I think there's a lot of those, if we pause to think where we wish we had maybe been more intentional with prayer. Yeah, I think about times when I've been faced with a big decision about yeah. something. Yeah. I tend to react 
mm-hmm. instead of stopping and praying and saying, Lord, what would you have me to do? Mm-hmm. I think much of the time, as I've heard you guys kind of echo, it's in the times that I failed to pray that I end up later having the most regrets. Not because prayer is some kind of magic formula that makes everything turn out okay, but just because I knew I was operating in my own wisdom and not God's. Yeah, I appreciate that, Bill, because I think we can all relate to that Mm -hmm. for sure. There's a passage. It's not going to be the core passage that we talk about today, but I think it's worth reading because it's kind of encouraging for us when we think about prayer and maybe the times we forget to pray or when we're praying and we don't know what to say or whatever. This is Romans 8 verses 26 through 27. Could somebody read that for us? Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know how to pray as we ought, But that very spirit intercedes with sighs too deep for words. And God, who searches the heart, knows what is the mind of the spirit, because the spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. Yeah. And this reminds us, right, that as we're talking about these practices in general, we're doing this in partnership with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's the first mover. He's the driver of our spiritual formation, of making us godly, of making us like Christ. It's the Holy Spirit's work in us. And that's really good because it takes the pressure off of those times we forget to pray or we didn't say the right thing or whatever. God's in the background praying with us, which is pretty cool. And the thing that I like about it is that because he knows the mind of the Father, he can pray according to the will of God. We don't necessarily know what the will of God is, but the Spirit does. That's right. I mean, just to try to lighten the guilt load here, because none of us do this right I mean, as we turn our hearts toward God just as a matter of daily positioning, you know, the Spirit is already working on our behalf. You know, if we don't magically utter the right words, it doesn't mean he's folding his arms and ticking his tongue at us. You know, it just means, you know, we're not aware of what he's doing. In that same passage a little earlier, verses 15 through 17, talk about it's the Spirit who is even the one that inspires us to be able to look to God and cry out to him as our Father, as Abba, as Daddy. And so even that's a a form of prayer, Mm -hmm. of just crying out to God as our Father. And the Spirit helps us even with that. But I think if we're going to talk about prayer, there's one passage we kind of have to talk about, (laughs) which is Jesus taught about prayer. (laughs) So it feels like if we're going to talk about this as a practice and a biblical practice at that, it'd probably be good for us to consider what Jesus himself said. (laughs) And not only because he taught about it, but he practiced it consistently too. I mean, so let's read Matthew chapter six, beginning in verse five, and we'll read through verse 13. And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door and pray to your father who is unseen. Then your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. When you're praying, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your father knows what you need before you ask him. Pray then in this way. Our father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And do not bring us to the time of trial, but rescue us from the evil one. Yep. So sometimes we have to do a lot of work with context and the original languages and all of that to try to figure out what's happening in a passage. (laughs) This one's... A gift in that way, because you don't have to do much work. It's Mm. pretty clear. Mm. What does Jesus warn about at the beginning? What? How should you not pray? Like hypocrites. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and what? What are the signs of that? Well, in Jesus's generation, there were people who would literally go out on the street corners and pray very loud, long prayers, just so people would walk by and say, "Wow, look how spiritual they are," you know that kind of thing. When actually their purpose was to impress those people rather than to talk to God. And we can do that too. Yep, yeah. exactly. Yeah. <laughs> we can too. <laughs> Which is the other part, mm-hmm, right here? Mm-hmm. Don't heap up empty phrases, mm-hmm. as the Gentiles do, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. Sometimes that convicts me. 
<laughs> you know what? If I repeat what I really want from God enough times, yeah. eventually <laughs> he'll hear it and give it. Right. To and me. there's such a, th- a fine line even with yeah. that because sometimes there can be a sense of, in terms of asking God more than once, a sense of faithfulness totally. and trust. Mm-hmm. But then there are other times, specifically in this context, he's referring to lengthy, very eloquent, yeah, showy, you know, show, yeah. you know, prayers, and you, you know, and sometimes you can even have that like prayer voice or like yeah. 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 stained glass <laughs> voice, right? Yeah. And yeah. as opposed to like just yeah. honest mm-hmm. vulnerability, rawness. Yeah. yeah, I think you're right, Rasul, and I think praying for something over and over and over again only gets wrong if our motive is trying to convince God to have it our way. Mm. Yep, because there would be a lot of faithful, loving moms who have repeated phrases mm-hmm. for their kids over and over and over mm-hmm. again, who they should not hear this as That's right. what they were doing was not the right way to pray. That's right. The heart of this is your father knows what you need before you ask. Mm. When I make requests and stuff, the phrase that I keep coming back to from Jesus's model prayer here is your kingdom come, your will be done on earth mm-hmm. as it is in heaven kind of having that as a mental touch point of, yeah, it is ultimately about God's purposes and God's desires and God's intentions as opposed to my desires. And that's how this prayer is structured. It starts upward. Mm -hmm. And then as we pray to our Father who's in heaven, holy is your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Then it becomes outward Mm -hmm. as God provides for our needs and others. Mm -hmm. Give us today our daily bread, right? Forgiving one another and being forgiven. And then as we walk through all the difficulties and trials and pains of this world, asking God to to help us with those things, um, to deliver us from evil, uh, to rescue us from the evil one. So there's this beautiful prayer here. And some people have taken this prayer and they use it as the discipline mm-hmm. itself, mm-hmm. right? Repeating this prayer to help it shape them to depend on God first. And then out of that, to then go out into the world. And the Holy Spirit empowers that and helps us. And it means that whatever prayer is for you today, if it means no words and just sitting with God in silence because mm-hmm. of how hard mm-hmm. life is, if it means inwardly groaning as Romans talks about as prayer, or if it means praying through the Lord's prayer, It's a reorientation of our dependency and our trust in God and walking with God in our everyday. So in our last conversation, we talked about one of the most obvious spiritual practices or disciplines, which is prayer. There's a type of prayer in particular that I don't think we talk about enough in Christianity, and it's called lament. In fact, there's a whole book of the Bible named after this spiritual practice called what? Lamentation. <laughs> yep. Lament's a fancy term for just drawing attention to what's broken, what's wrong in the world, what's wrong in our lives, what's going on with those that we care about, the way that they're suffering. Most of the time, it also includes asking God to do something about it, to fix the problem, to be present. But sometimes, like in Psalm 88, which is some... Scholars have called a lament like no other, Mm -hmm. because most of the time in the Psalms, at the end of a lament psalm, there's a turn of trust or hope that God will make this right. Psalm 88 doesn't have that at all. (laughs) It actually ends with, you have caused friend and neighbor to shun me. My companions are in darkness. Whoa. I think I've seen that on a greeting card somewhere. (laughs) (laughs) Stitched on a pillow. And it's throughout the Bible. We're going to look at one today. We're going to read Psalm 142, which is a lament psalm. And sometimes it even includes accusing God. And it's a very human way to cry out to Mm. God, as we'll see. And that's a characteristic of a lot of the book of Job. Yeah, it it sure is. is. Well, and I think it's important for us to talk about because Mm -hmm. some of us grew up hearing, don't question God, you should never blame God. But whether we should or not, the Psalms are full of it. And there's a lot of other places in the Bible that are full of lament as well. So there seems to be something that the Bible is modeling where when we are in pain and we are suffering, we can bring even that to God in the most honest Mm -hmm. and raw way Mm -hmm. that we can. And I think we'll see that in Psalm 142. So let's start there and read Psalm 142. Maybe, Rasul, you could get us started. Yep. With my voice, I cry to the Lord. With my voice, 
I make supplication to the Lord. I pour out my complaint before him. I tell my trouble before him. When my spirit is faint, you know my way. In the path where I walk, they have hidden a trap for me. Look on my right hand and see there is no one who takes notice of me. No refuge remains to me. No one cares for me. I cried out to you, O Lord. I said, You are my refuge, my portion in the land of the living. Give heed to my cry, for I am brought very low. Deliver me from my persecutors, for they are too strong for me. Bring my soul out of prison, so that I may give thanks to your name. The righteous will surround me, for you will deal bountifully with me. Yeah, so there's some heavy ideas in there. Mm -hmm. What is the title of, of this one that we're given? When David fled into a cave and prayed. (laughs) Yep, yep. So Mm. praying for deliverance, praying for help, fleeing into a cave. When you plan your day, you don't really want to end up fleeing into a cave at some point. Um, Where do you see lament in this prayer? And maybe specifically look for words like complaint or cry out or something like that. Well, verse 2 says, I pour out my complaint before God. I declare my trouble before him. And it seems like laments often accompanied by weakness, um, yeah. exhaustion, mm. uh, tears, just being at the end of your rope. And that's what he says, when my spirit is faint. The word cry appears, verse one, I cry aloud to the Lord. Verse five, I cry to you, Lord. Verse six, listen to my cry, mm-hmm. for I am in desperate need. And I'm thinking about that in a cave, mm-hmm. right? Because mm-hmm. that means there's going to be this echo. Yeah. And it'll even amplify this sound. But there's also a sense, I think, in which lament often can exaggerate because we become so mm-hmm. burdened and overwhelmed mm-hmm. and emotional that we can overstate hmm. our struggle. I think about him saying, no one cares for my soul. Well, his mighty men cared for him mm-hmm. and they protected him. And when he was thirsty for the water of the well of Bethlehem, they risked their lives to get it for him. So at least at that time in a cave, somebody was caring for his soul. Yeah. And in that section, Bill, I think that's such an important part of this psalm. Because talk about giving language for us today to relate to at times. Mm -hmm. There's no one who takes notice of me. No refuge remains for me. No one cares for me. We all end up at that spot at some point. I want to go back to Rasul to the crying out language that you notice. Now, that phrase cry out is something that shows up in the Bible quite a bit. Mm -hmm. And probably the most famous example of that is Exodus chapter 2, verses 23 through 24. Could someone read that for us? During that long period, the king of Egypt died. Mm. The Israelites groaned in their slavery and cried out. That's right. And their cry for help because of their slavery went up to God. Hmm. God heard their groaning and he remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. So God looked on the Israelites and was concerned about them. So cry out and groaning. Hmm. And God hears those cries. And throughout the whole Bible, there's example after example of people who are experiencing injustice, people who are experiencing suffering, people who are under attack, and they cry out to God and God hears them. There's quite a few stories that mirror the Exodus story. of I cried out and God heard me. Even that language of crying out to God and him hearing is something that we see out quite a bit. Um, And it seems like too, the other aspect in Exodus is that's a bit different from Psalm 142 is that collective Mm -hmm. groaning and crying out because of a collective issue of slavery kind of makes sense that people appealing to that situation together that it's like, wow, God hears the groaning. Yeah. And then that triggers a response. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And sometimes his response is surprising. Like Mm -hmm. in Exodus, when God says to Moses, I I hear the cries of my people and I'm coming down. Mm -hmm. And you can just imagine Moses like, yeah, here we go. This is what we've been waiting for. And then God says, and I'm sending you. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Welcome aboard. So, which also is another theme that shows up in the Bible. Often God's response Mm -hmm. uh, is through people. The one aspect of lament that this particular Psalm 142 doesn't really accuse God of anything, but in Psalm 88, man, listen to just some of these. You have put me in the depths Mm -hmm. of the pit, Mm -hmm. in the regions dark and deep. 
Your wrath lies heavy upon me. You overwhelm me with all your waves. You have caused my companions to shun me. You have made me a thing of horror to them. Verse 14 of 88. Oh Lord, why do you cast me off? Why do you hide your face from me? Verse 18. You have caused friend and neighbor to shun me. My companions are in darkness. So we have a, like a lot of accusatory language toward mm-hmm. God of, Lord, the experience I'm having right now makes me feel like you're doing all of this to yeah. me. And again, it sounds a lot like Job. It does. Yep. So why do you think lament is an important and helpful spiritual practice <laughs> for us? Well, I, I remember a, a man who his wife endured a horrific brain disease, and he talked about lament as being a tonic for suffering. And as he cried out to God, he experienced God's presence. And he talked about how that crying experience and God's presence gave him compassion for others to share with them. And so I I just wonder if we need to embrace lament as it's a tonic for us. It's that whole thing that Paul talks about in 2 Corinthians 1, you know, that that's the way we might experience God's compassion, not just for us, but so that we're able to express it to others when they're lamenting. I think that the scriptures are giving us a clear model to realize that the first step in being reoriented is actually admitting where you are. The process to true healing and reorientation starts with crying out. Mm. It reminds me of the Negro spirituals, Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. you know, during slavery. Sometimes I feel like a motherless child. Sometimes I feel like a motherless child. We have to get to that place and allow God into those places Mm. of our sensitivity so then he can elevate us to get to the end of the psalm Mm -hmm, part. mm -hmm. It reminds me of when Lazarus dies Hmm. and Mary and Martha Mm. are distraught. And they cry out and they accuse. Who do they accuse? Jesus. Jesus. You could have been here. If you would have been here, my brother would not have died. And what is Jesus' response? Does he fix it right away? No. Mm -hmm. He He talks about his father being glorified by his delay. Mm -hmm. His response is different to Martha than it is to Mary because Martha leaves the door open for hope. She says, Mm -hmm. but even now, Mm -hmm. I know that God will do whatever you ask him Mm -hmm. to do. And Jesus' response to that, instead of just fixing it really quick or saying, you shouldn't doubt me or whatever, is to cry with them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And one of the most beautiful pictures I think we have of God is we have a God that when we cry out to him with the true authentic, painful, I'm suffering, why aren't you doing anything about it? God's response, as we see in Jesus, is to cry with us. And that's, I think, one of the most beautiful pictures of lament in the Bible. Yeah, God invites us to share with him what we really think and what we feel. He's not afraid of our questions and our doubts. God isn't intimidated by our anger or our frustration. He invites us to be honest with him. And that's why this form of communication with God can be, as Daniel said earlier, one of the most life-giving versions of prayer. The value of lament as a spiritual discipline is what Daniel and Elisa and Bill and Rasul talked about in that part of this conversation about spiritual habits and training here on the Discover the Word podcast. And in just a moment, we will wrap up part one of looking at these various spiritual practices found in Scripture and that the church has emphasized in different ways throughout its entire history, basically. And we'll be highlighting a spiritual practice that doesn't really seem at first like a spiritual practice. I'm not sure I would ever put friendship in the category of a spiritual discipline. But is it? Is it something that we should intentionally make an effort to include as part of our commitment to Christ. Well, back with that part of the conversation in just a moment. Discover the Word is part of Our Daily Bread Ministries. And you may not know this, but in addition to our radio programs and podcasts, devotionals and books, we also have unique programs that reach out to people with specific needs across the globe. One example would be our Be A Light project in Indonesia, which distributes packages including a solar light and Bible engagement material to remote villages that do not have electricity. We are so grateful for your support that makes it possible for us to share the life-changing story and wisdom of the Bible. 
And so if you'd like to get involved, go to discovertheword.org, click the Donate button. That's up at the top of the page. And so I've got a question for you. How many close friends would you say that you have? Well, according to a 2023 Pew Research study, 53% of American adults say they have between one and four close friends. 38% say they have five or more. And 8%, sadly, say they have no close friends. Well, friendship, it's an important part of life. And in this segment, they're going to talk about friendship and put it in a category that you may not have ever thought to put it before. We're going to talk about friendship as a spiritual discipline. So why would friendship be part of our current study about spiritual habits and training? Pull your chair up to the table, and let's explore why. Respond to this quote. The more our relational capacities are developed through human friendships the greater will be our capacity to explore the rich potentialities within a deepening friendship with God. We must develop closer friendships with other believers in order to make room in our lives for God. Greater intimacy experienced with others increases our capacity to become more intimate with God. Hmm. And that's from Klaus Isler in his book, Wasting Time with God. I think maybe the opposite is equally as true. I, I think about it in the the image of the cross, Mm -hmm. unless the vertical beam's in place, the horizontal beam doesn't have anything to hang to. And so the stronger our intimacy with God, the more potential there is for horizontal relationships to have intimacy. That's good, Bill. And in applying that, I was thinking about how I've enjoyed lots of friendships in my life with friends, you know, people friends. But when I became friends with God, when I began to understand that he likes me, (laughs) that he even loves me no matter what, that he loves me more than I can ever imagine, that he calls me his beloved, Hmm. I I got a kind of security that made what I think might have been a little bit more desperate friendships, less desperate and more whole. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I kind of see it as a triangle and that both can kind of get you closer Mm -hmm. there Mm -hmm. because there is something about the relational dynamic, even when I think about the greatest commandment, right? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. There is this basic aspect, even from when we're kids, right? Yeah. <laughs> Where it's like, hey, you want to be my friend? Yeah. Or like, let's go play. That yeah. the capacity to experience bonds and connections with other people mm. does give me some categories and some framework mm-hmm. to even grasp what it means to be a friend of God. Yeah. I kind of see it as a circle. So if you can picture a circle in your mind and at the top of the circle is friendship with God and at the bottom of the circle is friendship with others mm. and then they just feed into each mm-hmm. other mm-hmm. Mm. because there is a sense in which our human relationships impact the way we view who God is, how we expect God to interact with us, whether they should or not, they do. Mm -hmm. And so I think what's beautiful in this picture is this idea that as we become better friends with each other, we become better friends with God. As we become better friends with God, we become better friends with each other. And both of those are increasing our capacity, our ability to experience life-giving friendship. And that's the practice that we're going to end this week talking about is friendship and community. Which uh, you don't think of as a spiritual discipline. I mean, right. I don't. Yeah. I don't. Yeah. No, me neither. I might think about church. You think about you fellowship. <laughs> yeah, fellowship. However you define fellowship. Yeah. Right. Yeah, and I think there's a passage in particular that that's one of the most surprising things about this passage is the use of the word friends. Hmm. Let's read John 15 verses 12 through 17, and then we'll talk about what the context is and all that too. So somebody could read that for us. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. No one has greater love than this to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. I do not call you servants any longer, because the servant does not know what the master is doing. But I've called you friends, because I've made known to you everything that I've heard from my father. You did not choose me, but I chose you, and I appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last, so the Father will give you whatever you ask him in my name. I'm giving you these commands so that you may love one another. 
Did you see friendship mentioned at all? Yeah. Yeah. Several times. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what's the context for this passage? Upper room discourse (laughs) the night before the cross. Yep. Just moments before they would leave the upper room and head to Gethsemane where Jesus would be arrested. I'm struck by the contrast between friend and servant. You know, I no longer call you servants because the servant does not know what the master is doing. I call you friends Mm. because Mm -hmm. I've made known to you everything that I've heard from my father. Yeah, that's one of the things about Abraham. He's referred to as a friend of God. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a bit almost shocking. It almost can feel irreverent Mm -hmm. that the God of the universe, my creator, can relate to me or that the text invites me to see him as among other things, Lord, Savior, friend. Yeah. And what are some of the like elements or foundational ideas that you see in this passage about friendship? In a few hours, he's going to prove the depth of his friendship for them by laying down his life. As he says, greater love has no one than this, that you lay down your life for your friends. Yeah. So there's an element of deep sacrifice Mm. I think the other thing that's in that same verse in 13 and then verse 17, love. Mm. Yeah. Uh, and then disclosure in verse 15. Yeah. That's the difference. The key difference, he says, because a servant doesn't know his master's business. Mm. I've called you friends because I've made things known to you. I've made myself known to you. And so that level of disclosure is a key part of what it means to have a friend and to be one. Yep. There's some openness, communication, honesty, Mm -hmm. all kind of tied into the idea of disclosure. It's a different kind of access. Yeah. Yeah. I'll tell you that of the 10 things you've got for us to discuss in these two weeks, this is one of the hardest for me. Hmm. The reason it's hard is because I spent so much of my adult life as a pastor. And maybe this isn't true where you guys go to church, but oftentimes... If it seemed like I was getting to be too good of friends with somebody in the church, other people reacted against that and became very critical and even angry at times. And it was just, it became, for over 20 years, it became so hard Hmm. to have meaningful friendships that still today, it's very difficult for me. Yeah, and there's a lot of people that are listening right now and uh, around the table with us that feel that that too, I'm sure, Bill. So thank you for sharing that. And I think that's where maybe there's some, it doesn't fix it, but maybe there's some encouragement in this passage for us because in the upper room discourse is the one time that we see Jesus nod forward to us, right? He prays and he doesn't just pray for those who follow him then, but those who will follow him later. And so in a way you could say he was praying for us. This idea of friendship goes on to really be a foundational idea for the church in general, this idea of community, of friendship. So I think it would be important for us to read one more section that talks about friends a little bit as well. Hebrews 10 verses 19 through 25, if somebody could read that for us. Therefore, my friends, since we have confidence to enter the sanctuary by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way, that he opened for us through the curtain that is through his flesh. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us approach with a true heart and full assurance of faith with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering for he who has promised is faithful And let us consider how to provoke one another to love and good deeds, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another all the more as you see the day approaching. So notice the author of the letter, what does he call those people that are going to hear this letter and receive it? My friends. Mm -hmm. My friends. And then in this whole description, he's building off of exactly what we saw Jesus say in John 15 that I'm going to show you my love by laying down my life for you. And as a result, this that's what binds friends together, right? True friendships and community. Let me ask you a question, Daniel. I don't want to get you too far off track, but earlier you said friendship or community. Mm-hmm. It feels to me like those are different things. Community is broader and more inclusive, 
whereas friendship seems to be much more personal and intimate. Yeah, community is almost like you're a part of something, but nobody really has to know you or you don't have to know them. Yeah, I think it depends if we mean community is in the place that we live, right? So I live in a community. Yeah. Or if we're talking about community, communing mm-hmm. together with our friends. Because a lot of times, especially in younger generations, you'll say, I just don't have any community. What they mean by that is not, I don't live in a neighborhood. They mean, right. I don't have any close friendships. And I think really what we see, what true community or friendship should be is described at the end of this passage where he talks about provoking each other to love and good deeds, right? So encouraging each other, yeah. challenging each other, not neglecting to get together and hang out, which in the context of this is talking about being in the church community. You got to spend time together if you're going to build close friendships and encouraging one another. And so I think we see that, you know, one of the greatest gifts of Christianity is the fellowship that we get to share with one another through Christ. Christ calls us friends, so now we can call one another friends as well. And so going back to that quote at the beginning, our friendship with God increases our capacity to have friendship with others. Mm -hmm. And our friendship with others increases our relationship with God because it is a circle. That's why we included friendship as a spiritual discipline. Because if we think we don't need friends and we don't need community, well, our relationship with God will suffer. We have a personal faith, but we don't have an individual faith. We need others, and others need us. And that's a good way to wrap up part one of our study called Spiritual Habits and Training here on the Discover the Word podcast. Daniel and Elisa and Bill and Rasul we we'll back to pick this up in our next episode. I hope you'll be here too. And since Bible engagement is what we're about at Our Daily Bread Ministries and what we do here on Discover the Word, I don't think it will surprise you that one of the spiritual habits that we're going to stress next time is Bible reading. And we're told it should be life-giving, but is it always? And so why is making reading scripture a spiritual habit, a spiritual discipline that we commit ourselves to, why is it something that we need to train ourselves to do for godliness? Well, that's where we'll start the conversation next time we discover the Word. Discover the Word is a small group Bible study from Our Daily Bread Ministries in Grand Rapids, Michigan, in which we invite you to walk with us through topics and passages that inform the way we read the scriptures challenge us as we live our lives as followers of Christ and point us to discover Jesus in the pages of the Bible. Thanks for listening. I'm Brian Hedinga. Discover the Word is provided by Our Daily Bread Ministries.